Again, we're in the second week of this series called Ridiculous Faith. We've been looking at the stories of the prophet Elisha. This is hundreds of years prior to Christ. This guy was apprenticed by Elijah, a really similar name, that's the confusion of it, and, and was a prophet, and he asked God, the bold thing he asked was that God would have a double impact, that God would double this blessing or this anointing on his life compared to what he did in Elijah's life, and God did it. And so we as a church are taking this bold step, we're asking God to do the same, to, to double the impact of what we're doing. So if you wondered why you got a double stuffed Oreo on the way in, it's because if there's one common thread Nate and I share outside of Jesus, it's double stuffed Oreos, okay? It is the single greatest food ever made. It was a staple food group in my upbringing, and it's just a reminder. So eat a cookie, pray that God would double the impact in your life. And we're looking at Bible stories today about Elisha and what God did to double the impact. I want you to see a picture of this. This is a Stearman biplane. Okay, this was a World War II training plane. You've maybe seen these before. You might not have realized how old it was, but these were used for training pilots in World War II. And one of our friends out in Verona, where I grew up, essentially just to the east of us, um, have this small airstrip out there in Verona, a grass airstrip, and they're part owners of one of those Stearman planes, a blue biplane like that. And they said, you got to get this experience. I'd flown with them before in little Cessnas. I'd flown with them in helicopters. I'd never flown in an open cockpit, open cockpit Cessna. But here was me uh, just a few short years ago. I sent this picture to Lauren. I had no plans that day of going flying. It was just an opportunity. I pulled up. They said, you want to go up? I sent Lauren this picture. She said, what's with the goofy headset? I then sent her this picture from the air. I said, that's me in the front. She's like, why are you in the front seat? <laughs> like, who is flying the plane? And my response was, I don't remember his name, okay? I honestly didn't remember who it was. It was one of their friends. I just trusted the guy. We went up in the air. And then this was the view of uh, some area that we farm. Like, you just had this incredible view, and I'll tell you the truth about it. It, it. It's not my plane. I was not in control of it. It was not my qualification to fly it. But the longer I was up there, the more I started to think, I could do this. <laughs> you know, there's only like two pedals and a, a stick and a throttle. And so it's like a, you know, like a big lawnmower in the air, right? Like one motor. Like I could figure this out. And anybody who knows anything about flying thinks, you're not going to figure this out, right? You're not just going to... Uh, pick up and be like a decent bowler or something. Like, oh, I happen to be a decent pilot. I'd never done it before. Like, there's no way you could do this. But when it comes to you and I operating in life, we all the time have this instinctive thought that we know what's best for us. And, and we lose navigation of true north all the time. And, and, and some folks, you've even been in charge in some capacity in your life for so long. You've had so much success and then you can't figure out why the success doesn't translate to all other areas of your life. And you're excellent in business. Some of us have, have skyrocketed. We've been intelligent financially, but we struggle relationally. We can't seem to, to, to be good at home. We can't seem to, to be the parent that we want to be. Others of us, we were the life of the party, and, and we, were, we were so much fun. We had a, a charisma that was infectious, and people wanted to be around. And on the back end of that, outside of our control, addiction started to creep in. Like, and there's always this like, balance of, of people who were really successful. They were in control of different capacities in their life, but then life happened, and other areas of... of out of control crept in. And we, lost, we just thought we'd be better at flying the plane than we are. There's even some of us, and we know the right answer because you've been churched for a long time. Jesus is in control, like the Lord is my shepherd, right? I shall not want. You quote something like that, you're really comfortable with saying the right thing until it comes down to applying it to you. When you have to step out in faith and trust that God is actually in control in your darkest hour, and, and you're reminded that that it's God who's flying the plane. And the principle that we're reminding ourselves of today is this, that you can't make God move in your life, but you can go to where God is moving. I want you to hear that over and over again today. You can't make God move, but you can go to where God is moving. And we got to ask the question, if God's going to double the impact of this ministry, if God's going to double the impact for the kingdom's sake, not for my wallet's sake, not for my comfort's sake, but if God's going to double the impact in these communities of what he wants to do, where do I need to yield? 
Where do I need to move to where God is already moving? And get on board with, with him being in charge and being the pilot of this plane. I think God has a great plan for our life. I think there's a great invitation for each of us, for each of us to have a vital role in how the church operates in the community. And I think if we would step out in ridiculous faith, we would see God move in ways that were outside of our control, but gave us life that was more abundant and more full of joy than anything we could imagine. I want us to have a heart that moves to where God's already moving. We're looking at a story today in 2 Kings chapter 4. I want you to follow along in your YouVersion Bible, and your paper Bible. Uh, you can follow along on the screen, but let me challenge you. I want you looking at the Bible just out of the habit of getting into that because I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to take God's word for it, and I want you to turn to Scripture, not me, okay, for direction. Now, I'll tell you up front. When I was 19 years old, I heard this story for the first time in my life, and it changed everything about my relationship with God. I don't promise that to be how you respond to it, but I can tell you it was, it was a game changer, and it's probably the reason I'm still in ministry today. It gave me so much hope when there was no hope, and it was the story of Elisha and a friend, a Shunammite woman. So 2 Kings chapter 4, I want you to take a look. Uh, I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 8, I want you to take a look. It says this, one day Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, whenever Elisha came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Uh, she was a, a wealthy and an established woman. Her and her husband had great wealth. They had the means by which to, to bless this man, not just with a meal, but she wanted to do something beyond that. Verse 10 says, so let's make a small room on the roof and put a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay here when, whenever he comes to us. Then they'll have a place. They, they, they were able to put an addition on the, the roof of their house. They, they wanted to equip this man that whenever he was passing through Shunem, See, prophets were, were mouthpieces for God that would communicate to kings, and kings would operate in leadership, and, and then you had priests. These were the three major offices that were represented. Elisha was a, a well-respected, not even like easy-to-access individual because he was a recognized man of God. And so the whole nation yielded to the direction of God's leading per what Elisha was communicating. And she understands that this is a holy man of God, and she's got... She's got something worth keeping around. There's a relationship value here of somebody who knows God better than her. She says, I want to put a, a room for him on our roof. So one day, verse 11, when Elisha came, he went up to his room and he lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her. Gehazi was his assistant and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her, you've gone to all this trouble for us. Now, what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? And she replied, I have a home among my people. You ever gotten one of those gifts, you know, that like you just didn't deserve? It's like such an act of generosity. And your first instinct, if you're like me, when somebody gifts you something unexpectedly, is like to pay that back. Do you know that feeling? Like I have to match what somebody did nice for me. You did a nice thing for me. I do a nice thing for you. You, you, you bought lunch today. I'll buy lunch next time. That sort of thing. That's essentially what Elisha's saying. What can we do for you? This is so kind. We eat here every time we come through town. We have a place to stay. And, and the woman re replies with, I've got a home among my people. Like I've got everything that life could offer. Like I'm fine. And then he continues in verse 14. And he asked Gehazi, his servant, he said, what could be done for her? And Gehazi said, well, she has no son, and her husband's old. And so Elisha said, call her. And so he called her, and she stood in the doorway. And the reality of, of the circumstance doesn't fall that heavy on our culture. But for her, the Shunammite woman was on borrowed time. When her husband passed, she would be left with nothing. The land would stay with the family name, and without an heir, she would essentially be a widowed orphan. She would have no one that would caretake for her. And yet the, the weight of what was coming never affected her generosity. She was content with where she was. 
And Elisha spoke up to her in verse 16 and said, About this time next year, Elisha said, You'll hold a son in your arms. She said, No, my Lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. Even when we trust God, there's corners of our heart. There's portions of us that, that we just don't know if God could really heal or have access to. There's sensitivity. There's places where I can praise God because today's a good day, but in the big picture, I'd prefer that he never talk about that again. You're still reminded of the pain of your childhood, or you're still uh, frustrated by the, the pain of a divorce. You, you wish you had the relationship that, that you dreamed of with your kids. You wish your employment was different. There's, there's all sorts of circumstances. And, and as long as nobody talks about them, when we keep it on the surface level, we can present as though things are okay. But ridiculous faith doesn't present on the surface. And ridiculous trust in a, in a holy God and in a mighty God and a God who's sovereign and over all things goes to him with dark corners. And this is what Gehazi picks up on. This is what Elisha picks up on. She doesn't have a son. This is a burdensome thing in her life that, that she's going through here. And she makes this promise and her response is, just don't mislead me. I know that this isn't going to happen. It's been my whole life. But, verse 17, but the woman became pregnant. And the next year about... That time she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha told her. There's a principle about God that we have to understand in ridiculous faith, and it's that God oftentimes shows up in our weakness more than he shows up in our strength. Your season of growing in dependence of God will always come through heartache and hardship. It's suffering. It's a place where the relationship actually grows roots and it changes. We've been in a season right now as a church where things are fun and abundant. If you've been around here much, like everything is everything we ever dreamed of. I don't know if you realize this. Just a couple weeks ago, when we celebrated Christmas, in a nine-day period, we saw 4,000 people reached as a church. That's not a real number I ever dreamt of. That's not a real number that I ever thought in, in my limited potential in God's kingdom that we would ever realistically reach. But we had Christmas Eve's Eve service on the 23rd. We had three here and three in Cole City, and, or two in Cole City, two over there in Seneca. Then we woke up the next morning. We did Christmas Eve services, our regular scheduled service times. We had over 2,500 people join us in person and online over that just two-day period. And we came back just a week later thinking we'd get crushed on New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve's a, a, a tough one. We came back above our average at 1,600. Over 4,000 people in, a, in an eight- or nine-day period. That we got the opportunity to share this good news of Emmanuel, God with us. I'll tell you something, though. Do you know where our faith grew most? It hasn't been in the seasons of abundance. I mean, we're praising God, we're gra grateful. When we grew as a church spiritually, it was when it was really hard. It was on mornings like this where you hoped that you could chip the ice open on the trailer and set up in a school. It was on, moments, it was on mornings like this when you hoped that somebody would pull in the parking lot and you would maybe get the opportunity to preach to 10 and we were limited on, we didn't have the access to online. And so if, if you missed on Sunday, you missed, you, you went two weeks then without being able to connect with your church body. We don't have any of those limitations anymore. Like what God's done is opened up the floodgates. And I'm grateful for every struggle along the way because of what it did to us spiritually to grow us. It's a hard moment to trust God. It's logical that it would, it would seem logical that in seasons of abundance it would be when God blesses us, but it's, it's actually the opposite. Friends, we're standing on the miracles of God's blessing in spite of our weakness. Moments when we didn't deserve to shepherd God's people or to lead them in worship. Moments when we were far from qualified, but God showed up and grew and multiplied something for his kingdom's sake. So I want to jump back into the story. and I, Verses 18 through 26, I just want to overview for you. You should go back and read it on your own. But the woman raises a son for the next 11 or 12 years. Until her son is out working with his father one day, and he fell ill. And so the father raced the boy home to his mother, where he died in her arms. And it just seems unfair. It just seems like it would have been less pain to have never had the son at all. I, I think that's the kind of pain that's more relatable for folks when they hear this story. 
I know that's what it felt like in my life. Like, God, why would you even show up in it to begin with? You got to ask the question, like, where do we go when God shows up in a dream, breathes life into a dream, and the dream dies? You ever had something you just begged God for? And there was a flicker, there was a flash where things started to take off. They started to take root. And it was, it was God, I, I know that you were going to show up in this. And then it went sideways. And, and the Shunammite woman's response was to saddle up immediately and set out on this course to find Elisha. Elisha, you were this man of God. You were the one who promised this. You were the connection to the Father. You were the one who offered this generosity up. What do we do when God shows up in a dream, breathes life into a dream, and the dream dies? Verse 27 says, When she reached the man of God, Elisha, at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone. She's in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and not told me why. He, he was, it, it, this is exactly the response of compassion that we should have when somebody's heartbroken. Like that she's just there heartbroken and he just sits in the pain with her. Gehazi's instinct is this is inappropriate. Clean yourself up. Like let's do the, not to Elisha. Elisha just meets with her right there in her pain. Verse 28, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? Did I even ask for this? Didn't I tell you don't raise my hopes? Do you know that you can vulnerably talk to the father this way? That you could just expose like the, the deepest truth of what you're struggling with, that you can go before God in this capacity. She goes to Elisha and says, why do we even do this? And Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt, take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet. And if anyone you anyone does greet you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. Customary for Jewish men to not run anywhere. He says, don't take a respectful journey. Tuck your cloak and get there. This is an emergency. Like, this is not business as usual. But I want you to see what the Shunammite woman's faith looks like. Because her response is this, but the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. What do we do when God shows up in a dream? Breathes life into a dream, and the dream dies. I'll tell you, we run to God. We run to him. We get as close to his presence as we can. You know what ridiculous faith is? Ridiculous faith trusts God when we have no earthly reason left to. Ridiculous faith trusts God when, when all logic aside says you shouldn't any longer. That's what ridiculous faith does. R ridiculous faith says, God, I'm, I'm following you, and I have no idea where we're going or why we're going there. It's just, it, it trusts, it follows, it roots in, it, it comes back to this basics of a God who's close to the brokenhearted and crushed in spirit. A God who comforts us in our time of need so that we can be a comfort to others in their time of need. Over and over again, we see King David get alone with the Lord in heartbreak. We see him wash his face in worship. Ridiculous faith says, I'm not walking out on this. When everything in you says, I'm walking out. You ever had that feeling of wanting to quit? Wanting to hang it all up? Ridiculous faith Trusting God in that capacity as he roots you, as he does something in you through the heartache, says, I'm not leaving, I'm not walking out on this. I'm going to walk into it, I'm going to walk through it with God. I know who my shepherd is. I know who the gatekeeper is. I know who's in control of this. So when sickness comes out of nowhere and it's unfair and you're way too young and it happens to the person that you love or your parents are aging quicker than you thought they would and, and it sets in, you go, I'm going to walk right through this because I know who the pilot is. I know who the captain is. I know who's in charge. I've got this readily available access to the Father through the Son. I'm going to take full advantage of it. So when my marriage hits the rocks, and I'm telling you, if you think you're the only marriage that struggles, you're wrong. Man, when you come into a church, you just think, this must be a room full of people who haven't figured out. This is just a room full of sick people who found the right doctor. That's the only common thread. And so when you hit those moments in your life, you go, I'm walking through this with you, Lord. We we're going to walk in. It might take all night. We might wrestle through this for weeks. It might take months to feel forgiveness or healing. 
It might take years for God to restore something. I'm going to walk into it. I'm going to walk through it with the Lord. When it's financial and it goes sideways, and your first instinct is to stop trusting God with that. We stay the course. I can't make God move, but I can go to where God is moving. There's this hunger outside of these walls. I think people want to know God. The question is, do you want to know God on your terms or on his? Because the answer to that question determines who is in the pilot seat. It determines your seat in the plane. If you're the passenger and you trust the pilot and you just met him and it's brand new and it's uncharted territory and the view from where you're looking at looks really bad. But I'm going to go to where God's moving. You can't make God move, but you can go to where he's moving. I think it's this kind of resolve and determination that says, no matter what, I need God. This is why Paul said, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. I was 19 I've shared this before. Some of you have heard this because it was a staple point. The reason the sermon meant so much to me is this was the lowest season of my life I'd ever gone through. Hindsight, this was chump change. I'd gone through nothing. But you know the first time you feel real stress and anxiety and you've never tasted it before and you're on your own? I was 19. I had begged God for this job. I had a whole plan. I told God every detail about it. He was not real interested in it. Here was the plan. I was going to get this job uh, painting houses for this company. The agreement was on the front end seemed like a great deal. They would insure me. They would provide me leads that I could then sell to. Uh, They would even provide me a line of credit. 19 years old. And, And they would help me get started in this business. All I had to do was give them a cut of the profit, and when I exceeded $100,000 in sale, I would bonus back. And $100,000 in sales over summer should be no problem for a young man of your caliber. That's what they told me. should be easy. Produced $82,000 worth of painted houses that summer at about $2,000 a pop. I employed... uh, at the end, six people. I got good at firing people. Also employed at most nine people at one time. Uh, multiple houses getting painted. My lowest houred employee made more than I did that summer. I hit the end of my summer with not a dime to my name. And by not a dime, I mean nothing. Okay? Like the big zero. Uh, guys, I was going to Sam's Club for lunch for the free samples. Because I was too embarrassed to tell my parents that I didn't have any money in my pocket to, to make lunch. But I had a Sam's Club card. It was stupid. I had so much pride and arrogance. Anyway, I get to the end of summer. Remember that line of credit that was so handy? Sherman Williams wanted their $1,100. $1,100 might as well have been $110,000. Because when you have nothing, it, it was insurmountable. And now I'm registering for classes and I'm signing my name on documents like, yeah, I will find a way to pay you back this many thousands of dollars so that I can come sit in your classroom that I don't even want to be in anymore. Like, the whole plan, God, was that if I made enough money this summer, I I would go back and I would work for this new church. They've got no money and I'll work for them for free. I'll come out with no debt and I'll just live at home and I'll I'll pinch my pennies on a part-time job. This is the way it's going to work, God. And now all of that was over. I just went and poured my guts out to Nate. Like, I don't know what to do about this. I'll tell you where it really hit the, the rubber hit the road. I don't know what you thought I was going to say there. Um, Where it really went sideways was I was out in a barn with my dad. And my dad was given the right, like, Christian dad answers. Like, hey, God's still good, bud. Yeah, yeah. And uh, these were my exact words. It wouldn't hurt him to throw me a bone once in a while. And I walked out of the barn. It, like my dad had never felt stress before. Like, you don't know what it's like to be 19 and $1,100 in debt. <laughs> you know? You don't understand. I walked inside. I, I kid you not. I don't know if it was that next day or the day after. I'd scrapped a bunch of steel. I had about 100 bucks to my name, like wherever I could find scrap steel. Uh, I, was, I was just taking it to the scrapper and getting cash for this. 
I got an envelope from my aunt and uncle, an envelope um, with just a note that said, hey, bud, we know uh, college is expensive, wanted to give you some spending money. And it was a check for $1,000. And uh, oh, I hate this, you know? My dad leaned over my shoulder and said, what's that? And he looked, and he goes, it looks like a bone. I'm so grateful for God dragging me through a, a moment when I wanted to quit everything. I'm just so grateful that I went back to school with nothing. I'm just so grateful that I went back to work for a church that had nothing. Because at the proper time, you'll reap a reward if you don't give up. Like, I, I don't take it lightly what God's doing right now. Every ounce of pride in my body was spilled out on the floor. There was nothing left of me and only of him. And while I want God to show up in your dreams and breathe life into your dreams, while I want God to, to give you God-sized dreams and to bless you abundantly, I don't want your dreams to ever steal from your affection for God. I want you to never forget he's the provider that he is the author and perfecter of your faith, that he is, he is the source of all of your hope, that he is everything that you, you, he's where you push your chips in the middle of the table. He's, he's it. Here's how the story wraps up. Gehazi went on ahead, laid his staff in the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. Gehazi went back to meet with Elisha and told him the boy was not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on the couch. He went in, he shut the door, and the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed, and he lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. He stretched himself out, and the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi, called the Shunammite. And he did. When she came, he said, take your son. She came in, she fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. I don't think the Bible makes a mistake telling us the order that she took. That she praised God first. I want you to understand something. You have different access to the father than the Shunammite woman did. Because what Jesus did for you was he went to the cross and he now lays mouth to mouth and nose to nose and hand to hand and he covers you for all of your sin, for everything that has disqualified you ever, for every ounce of pride, for every moment of lust, for every inch of jealousy, for every uh, instance of greed. He's covered that on the cross that by grace, through faith in Jesus He's a great high priest that you don't need a man. You don't need me. You don't need Nate. You don't need anybody else, regardless of what they tell you they're qualified for, to go to the Father. You go to him through the Son. And if you've never heard that, you need to understand that, that this is a God who did a miracle. I understand. In the corner of the room, you're going, but this woman got her dream back. You didn't get your dream back. It didn't turn for you. I understand if you're in the, that season, how hard this is to hear. What he did for you was even greater. And he said, I will ensure you for eternity. Now trust me, we're going a new direction. I, I need you to understand this, that God gave us the ultimate blessing, deliverance from death by taking our death into himself. And the question is, have you responded to this gift? Have you responded to what he's done for you? He walks with us in the midst of our struggle. He covers us for our sin. He forgives us in full, past, present, and future. I want to remind you of this. You can't make God move, but you can go to where God is moving. So the question is, church, if you are a follower of Jesus, where is God moving? We got calls this week about people who go, I think God's moving me to do this in Shorewood. And our heart just leaps because of the obedience, because we know the, the vibrancy of, of a life that is that sold out to do what Jesus has called him to do. I'm just asking you, rhetorically, where is God calling you to move that he might double the impact for his kingdom's sake? Here's the third one I need you to consider. Blessings of God are found in our weakness. 
So where do you need to pray for God's help right now? Blessings given through persistence. Where do you need to walk in instead of walking out? These are hard questions. I need you to consider this. There's no addiction too strong, no life too broken, no sin too wicked, no regret too severe. God wants to give you his best, and he did with his son. He wants to bless you. He wants to, to use your story of what he's done in your life to grow his kingdom, and that you might get to taste in participation of this big picture.